recording it. No more recording it started. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about deployments and just uh, general experiences and observations from, from actual deployments. And so without, uh, without further ado, let's see if I can get this thing to work. And that's who I am, Jack Smith, KE4LWT. Uh, I'm an operations branch director. And I have to give this disclaimer. The views expressed in this presentation are solely those of the author and do not reflect the views of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Department of Homeland Security, or the US government. So some background on deployments and how things work is can be found in the National Incident Management System, the uh, uh, Emergency Support Functions 2, which is uh, communications infrastructure, uh, not communications, and mass care, which is ESF6. The memorandum of understanding between different agencies and organizations. Uh, I'm sure that Albemarle and Charlottesville have a, a, an MOU with the local amateur radio group as well as uh, VDEM has, uh, has one as well. FEMA has one and, and DHS above FEMA has a uh, memorandum of agreement. And these are just the major deployments. Going back to when FEMA only had three digit, uh, three, yeah, three digit deployments. So just kind of scroll through those. This is not all inclusive. Some of the challenges that we face in uh, during deployments. The first and foremost is an austere environment. Your, your emergencies, even planned events, require operating from either ad hoc facilities or facilities that are not normally intended for emergency operations. For an, as an example, in this photo, that 10 by 10 Walmart pop up on the roof was my office for several weeks and my hotel room for a few nights when I first got to Puerto Rico. Unfamiliar organization structures. The organizations you'll find yourself working with will have a structure that you may be unfamiliar with, no matter how many times you've worked with them in the past. Emergency communication support is never the same as you practice. There are just too many variables. Having said that, a competent trained operator will have no, no difficulties working in that environment. Evolving or devolving communication systems. The needs are always changing. As, as the situation develops, it could get better, worse, more consolidated, more dispersed. The only thing constant is change. And uh, John and I, when we were just doing a test run, we talked uh, briefly last night about the uh, pipeline disruption. And that's something that you know nobody would plan for, but that has uh, uh, the potential for serious impact. I mean, thank goodness it's happening at a time of year when the weather isn't either overly hot or overly cold. Um, I mean, just imagine if that would have happened like in January or February and the heating oil would have been interrupted going to, uh, well, to Virginia, uh, Maryland, DC, New Jersey, all through that area. Safety and security. Your safety and security are paramount. Without the communications you provide, the mission will not succeed, or at least not as well. If you have any concerns with your safety or security, relay that to the appropriate source. Usually there will be a site safety and security officer. That would be your starting point. Keep in mind, however, that some risks that are taken during, the emer during emergency operations are calculated ones, and there may, may be no way to completely re render a situation safe. So in order to get ready for a deployment, you, there are pre-deployment tasks you have to do. The first one is look at your family situation. Our first responsibility is to our families and then to our own safety. If you see that you may not be able to deploy due to a family situation, then make sure you inform, inform your deployment coordinator of that as soon as possible. Self-evaluation. Your own safety and health are equally important. 
if you have any accessible and functional needs, such as mobility restrictions, special dietary needs, or need for electrical power for devices such as oxygen concentrators, CPAP machines, or other stuff, make sure your deployment coordinator knows these. You may still be able to be deployed with those limitations, but the time to bring that up is not when you arrive at your mobilization station. Training. Are you capable and confident in what tasks you may be assigned? If not, perhaps taking the first couple of shifts with another operator who may be, uh, or who is, may be an excellent training opportunity. Don't place yourself in a situation that you are not entirely comfortable with. That only hurts the mission, the survivors, and the group you represent. Also, maintain a binder with your ARIES training task book, DHS auxiliary con uh, communicator, position task book, license, and any references you may need. Make sure you understand how to read an ICS-205 radio communications plan, 205A communications list phone book, the 207 organization chart, the 214 activity log, the 211 checklist. It's also helpful to at least be familiar with the ICS form 204, which is the assignment list, and the 206 medical plan. Work with the served agencies at your location uh, to know who message traffic for them will go to. It's not necessarily the same for all agencies at a given location. As, as an example, the Red Cross's regions in Virginia do not line up with the VDEM regions. Uh, similarly, Team Rubicons do not. So it, it may be that some traffic on behalf of one of those served agencies may be going to, uh, in your case, your VDEM region three. So Farmville is where region threes um, offices for VDEM. So your traffic for VDEM would be going to region three, but for the Red Cross, it would be going somewhere different. Readiness. This is, this is more than having a radio and a license. It's also physical and mental readiness. Being able to work long hours, often with little or no rest breaks, is very common in the early days of a disaster. Human resources are short, and relief may not be possible with the personnel available. Um, I don't really, I didn't mention this in my notes that I wrote for myself, but tempers will be short too. Uh, additionally, it's inevitable that you'll encounter survivors who want to tell you their stories or their complaints. This is extremely emotional in ways that I can't explain. You can and should practice by participating in local events like road races, parades, etc., to build the communications experience and to consider periodically practicing in the field with your deployment kit to confirm it's operational. Things like parks on the air, winter field day, and to a lesser extent, the regular field day are all excellent opportunities to refine your loadout and operations under austere conditions. The deployment kit. I saw that uh, Dave had sent out a packing list uh, or a go kit recommendation the other day. Uh, that's a very good that's a very good list that he sent. It's very similar to what we send uh, through my organization. I recommend using a modular system and having checklists. Showing out up without the items you need puts you in a position where you're now to the served agency, another mouth to feed. Don't put your agency in the situation where they're having to support you beyond what had been agreed to in the MOUs. Your organization may have a standing list, but frequently the requesting agency will issue one as well. In those cases, add anything not on one to the other unless it's specifically listed as a do not bring. Uh, as an example, for the government agency I work with, we're not allowed to even bring like a Gerber or a Leatherman. Uh, that is specifically a, a, a do not bring. If um, our MERS teams are allowed to have those in their toolboxes, but they can't carry it with them uh, outside their toolboxes. And the same thing applies if you go into some state or federal facilities. Notification. Have a solid plan for how to receive notification from your deployment manager. This may be multiple systems, 
such as text message, a monitor repeater, simplex channel, or as a last resort, a strip map to your home for in-person notification when other systems fail. These uh, pictures that I'm showing, by the way, are what's left of the town of Happy Camp, California. They lost 50% of their homes, all their communications, um, all their uh, emergency support equipment, everything. This actually should read redeployment, or sorry, no, that's correct, uh, deployment. Do not self-deploy. I really don't need to amplify on that one, but just don't do it. Report to the directed facility. It's highly recommended that everyone report to a single point for final checks, mission briefing, et cetera. There may be instances where you may be directed go, to go to directly to a given location, but these should be rare, rare and prearranged well in advance. Capabilities. Bring the capabilities needed. N5TIM, John Galvin, has an excellent resource typing system that's NIMS compliant and provides a template for bringing the resources required for a given mission. Your deployment manager should tell you what capabilities are required for the duties you'll be performing. Generally speaking, don't bring more than needed unless directed to do so. It's not unusual to have to, re to rapidly evacuate operational facilities due to continuing hazards. On every disaster I've worked, I've had to redeploy in just a few hours notice at most, often hundreds of miles. While you most likely won't have to go that far, it isn't unusual for fires, flood, hazmat, or even security incidents to shift toward your facility. Um, you know, if we look back to the 2017 um, incident in Charlottesville, the state had built one communications uh, facility you, uh, along with the uh, Virginia radio cache, and then they couldn't use it. Uh, fortunately, they didn't have to evacuate. They just never got to actually occupy and had to set up. In uh, Oroville, California, while I was there for the fires, we had to evacuate the emergency operations center because the fire was rushing towards us at about 60 miles an hour. Self-care. Take care of yourself but don't wait to the last minute to let your chain of command know that you may need relief. With planning, this can be mitigated and everyone can get the rest they need. Keep in mind that normal operational periods are 12 hours or multiple of that, and all planning done by the emergency management team is based on a 12 to 24 hour operational period. Relief, as mentioned above, relief is normally based on 12, 12 hour work periods. If possible, multiple, multiple operators should be assigned to manage the workflow and also to allow for meal, toilet, and rest breaks. If they're close enough to each other, you can have one person uh, be a roving operator and, uh, you know, like say, uh, using the schools as uh, shelters. You could have one person that would be a, a relief radio operator for, uh, for those and give everybody a, an opportunity to go take a break or you know, get a nap, get something to eat, whatever. Reassignment. As the situation evolves, there may be more or less need for communication support. As such, it's necessary to be ready to either consolidate operations or to relocate. Make sure your communications unit lead or other similarly responsible person knows how much communication support you're actually supplying. Don't make a decision on your own to redeploy. This is a task that the COMEL, the planning section, together with the incident command team has to make. Additional notes. While deployed, develop a method for tracking what you use and what you don't use. I carry a duffel bag with me, and every time I use something, I place it in that duffel bag. I also place any items that I consider safety essentials in there as well. This enables me to refine my load out to just what is needed and not carry excess items around on future deployments. Keep notes on what worked and what didn't work. This will enable you to write clear and concise after action reports to assist your group with future deployments. And that goes back to uh, you know, what I was saying earlier about the modular system. You know, there, the absolute I have to have it stuff would go in one bag. So like your first aid kit, 
additional batteries, you know, anything like that would go in there. And then your other bags, uh, those would be the ones that you would evaluate at the end of your deployment to see if you used and if you need to carry them with you again. Post deployment, do not self deploy, uh, demobilize. Just as deployments are planned and methodical, so are demobilizations. We call it right sizing. Uh, signing out. You may be required to go through a formal checkout process, and I highly encourage this. Collect up the ICS Forms 214 activity log, the, the 211 incident check-in list, and other forms that were used and provide the originals to the documents, documentation section or other designated person. If you were using WinLink, there's the ability to generate the ICS Form 309 communications log and provide that as well. Ask for a copy of the format of the after action report document so that you can begin working on that as quickly as possible. Also request any feedback or evaluations at this time. My agency does not allow us to demobilize without those being completed. Self-assessment. We all have things we can improve upon and deployments really bring those to the surface. Identify the top two or three and then work on improving them. It could be that you need to improve the way you load out. Maybe your documentation skills need polishing. Um, maybe practicing setting up your digital modes a little bit better or just even documenting how it, how it goes. Uh, on some of my radios, I have uh, uh, mailing labels where I have like the volume knob settings, the squelch knob settings and all those different things for the digital modes. Self-care, depressurizing and getting back to normal are important, but in the event of a large scale disaster, you may never be the same. And, and that's not a bad thing. Seek out coworkers, faith-based leaders, or others depending upon your belief system and talk about what you've seen, whether it be in the field or at the deployment site. Reset. This is where you go through your loadout and your packing list, repair, replace anything damaged or depleted and clean up your packing list. Your packing list will never be perfect, but you do need to refine it and keep it handy. What I do is I print a new one after every deployment, including the changes I make. I break it down into each module for my modular packing system and put those in the modules in a document protector. That way, when I'm in a rush to, to load out and leave, I have the ability to quickly check each section off individually and get them ready to go. Having this broken down into smaller sections also reduces the stress a lot. The system I talked about earlier where I filtered items into what was used, what is essential, and what was not used really comes into play here. And some observations from uh, uh, from different deployments. The first one is existing infrastructure systems are built with very little extra capacity, even in emergency services communication systems. Typically, they're designed around a maximum capacity seen in X amount of time. A good example of this would be sporting events where the cellular providers bring in mobile towers to temporarily add capacity. In large disaster, they're there usually aren't enough systems to go around. And this one comes in more true today uh, than we've really thought than I thought when I was writing this. Infrastructure relies on power, fuel, and support. Again, during large disasters, many of these will go offline pretty quickly. Usually within 24 hours as fuel runs out. In many cases, the same things that are keeping the responders occupied are the same things that are keeping these from being refueled as, or serviced. Tanker trucks and support personnel can't drive through fires, floods, deep snow or debris any more than we can. In remote operations, there just may not have ever been infrastructure to support those large operations. Amateur radio can be that bridge that brings in communications to those areas in order to support the survivors and the responders alike. As an example, where I was at in Northern California, the responders quadrupled the population. And of course, the, the civilian population wasn't on the radio constantly, but the responders were. So there was not enough 
infrastructure to support that. So that all had to be brought in. One of the most overlooked things that amateur radio operators can do is to provide situational awareness to those in the field. This can be in the form of weather reports, road conditions, operating hours, or other things that may be of use to the other amateur radio operators in the field, but can also be passed along to the survivors and responders. That's where your accessible and functional needs challenge radio operators can really uh, come into play because they can stay at one location and they can gather that stuff up send out um, a distribution through WinLink or other networks and get that out to people and keep it and keep it up to date. Insufficient utilization. If you have the ability to help with other tasks, do so if asked. If you have a particular skill set such as American Sign Language, a second spoken language, your database wizard, etc., make sure you let that be known. They know that your primary duty is as a communicator and that that will take priority. Having said that, someone just sitting around the EOC, the, in, the Emergency Operations Center, the Incident Command Post or other location just gives a bad, bad vibe to all the other people in there. There have been many times that I've helped load or unload trucks, push wheelchairs, or even helped roll up fire hoses. That's nowhere near my job description, but if I can do it and help to get the responders the help they need, to help survivors, and that's what I did. As a, a note on the photo, that's a young lady from the North Valley Animal Disaster Group helping to evacuate a koi pond. The radio she's carrying was issued by the state radio cache, but that service could just as easily, and I believe more quickly, provided by amateur radio groups. I, indeed, in many areas during the uh, fires in Northern California, that service was being provided by amateur radio groups. Special note concerning emergency communications. Or as Inigo Montoya said, you keep using that word. I do not think you, it means what you think it means. Emergency communications are legally defined as to provide essential communications in need needs in connection with the, the immediate safety of human life and immediate protection of property when normal communication systems are not available. All other communications during a disaster are not emergency communications. They're just communications during an emergency or during a disaster. Uh, people checking in and out of their duty location, uh, routine requests for supplies, et cetera, are not emergency communications. So just, you know, uh, I hear people sometimes say, you know, well, it, yeah, it's a declared emergency. Well, yeah, uh, everything I do is a declared disaster or a declared emergency. But in 40 plus years of government service, I've made exactly one emergency communication on a frequency that I was not normally authorized to be on. And now's the time where you get to ask me questions. Okay, uh, Jack, if you want to stop by uh, sharing there, uh, what do we'll that. do is uh, we will uh, uh, let people uh, call up things and I will I will pause recording here because I know there's some folks that don't like to show up on the screen. <laughs> <laughs>